thank you, Father, that we can share in your thinking. Open our minds to your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, chapter 9 of Romans. Um, again, this is about the Jewish question. What can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. Nothing in heaven, nothing on earth, nothing visible or invisible, nothing in the angelic realm or the human realm. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So, the question comes up, but didn't the Jews get separated from the love of Christ? Aren't they set aside? Uh, and so, chapters 9, 10, and 11 talk about the Jewish issue. And then chapter 12 picks up right where Paul left out in chapter 8. Uh, Therefore I urge you uh, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So he continues on and then presenting ourselves in a holy fashion to God. So we're in the middle. We're just starting into the, the Jewish issue. Well, has God forsaken the Jews who gave all those promises to? Now, we know that uh, there are still promises that the, are going to be fulfilled for the Jews. And one of those promises is they're going to possess the land without uh, hindrance. Uh, and there will not be any danger anymore. And it'll be completely different uh, lining out of the uh, land. I probably, probably touched on this before, but the land of Israel by the, on the Mediterranean Sea here, and we have the northern part, Galilee, and we have the southern part called Judah, and you have Judah, and uh, uh, you have all these different groups, tribes, but in the millennium, it's going to be like this. I didn't do all of them, but, but all the tribes are going to have from here on to the east, the Euphrates, and this is going to be how the tribes are lined out in the millennium. And that's spoken of in the book of Ezekiel. <laughs> now, there are many ways that uh, Paul could have approached this Jewish issue. Uh, he, he is a, a deep thinker. Let's just keep your finger there in Romans chapter 9 and turn to uh, Ezekiel. There is Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And I want chapter 40 of Ezekiel. Now, I spent a little time on this because many times Gentile believers think the Jews are done with. It's just the Gentiles that God is going to use now. And uh, we'll see a passage on that in, in chapter 10 or chapter 11. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 40. I just want you to put your finger in chapter 40 and turn to chapter 48 of Ezekiel. Now one of the ways Paul could have defended that no God is not done with the people of Israel is to uh, reference uh, Ezekiel chapter 40 through chapter 48. All of these chapters speak of the new Jerusalem in the millennium and how it's going to be organized that David is going to sit on his throne again, be resurrected and sit on his throne. And we're going to have the sons of Zadok who were faithful to the Lord in their day uh, resurrected and serving the Lord in his millennial temple. And so either the Jews uh, still have a plan 
or you need to take your scissors to cut out those nine chapters. Because those nine chapters haven't been fulfilled at any time. And God is going to fulfill His Word. Another way we can look at uh, the uh, permanence of, of the Jewish people and the plan for the Jewish people is, is to consider uh, the millennial reign of Christ. What is that for? Why is He reigning in Jerusalem? Uh, so, what Paul does in Romans beginning in chapter 9 is he lines out a very detailed concept so that we can get a picture into the thinking and the mind of God. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom of God. <laughs> we cannot comprehend God. We can't even begin to trace out all His plans. But He does give us some glimpses now and again. And those are amazing glimpses that he knows what he's doing and he does it perfectly. Uh, now we, we take that down to our own life. He knows what he's doing and he does it perfectly. That he has a plan for our life and we can trust him in all things. Let's go back to chapter 9 of Romans. Well, I say chapter 9 of Romans. Chapter 9, verse 14, we're going to go back to the book of Exodus. Uh, Exodus um, chapter 33. So Paul's quoting from Exodus 33. Now it's really interesting how he takes this. God doesn't reveal himself to just anyone. There's always flippant people that say, oh, I talked to the Lord yesterday and he told me this and that and whatnot. Really? Okay. Uh, does it line up with the word? That's what we have to determine. Because anybody can say anything and doesn't mean a thing if it, if it doesn't coincide with God's word. In chapter 33 of the book of Exodus, the second book, um, Verse 17, let's start there. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, interesting request, now show me your glory. Show me the glory, the majesty, the overwhelming radiance and perfection of God. And the Lord said, verse 19, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. Why does he say goodness? Because that is what God is. He is good. He is totally good. And everything about him is good. We have uh, the guardians to his character, the justice and the righteousness of God. We have a motivation in all his character, the love of God. But in essence, everything about God is good. I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Okay, your request, uh, I'm going to grant it. Now, if I were to ask that, he'd say no. <laughs> you know? Uh, I don't have the kind of closeness to intimacy that Moses had with God. Uh, but I see the character of God in the character of Christ. When I look in the Word of God and I'm reading and understanding His Word, His character is being reflected back into my soul and I'm becoming more Christ-like. And it's not a matter of a glory on the outside now. It's a matter of the glory of God on the inside of us. But notice he, he says here, when Moses is asking here for uh, a view of the glory, the perfection of God, God talks about his compassion. He talks about his mercy. I'm turning back to Romans 9 now. 
This is what Paul quotes. What should we say then, verse 14, is God unjust? Is he not fair? Not at all. By absolute, it's a double negative meaning. It's impossible, absolutely not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. God has compassion and mercy on every one of us. The unbeliever lives in darkness and cannot see or comprehend the glory of God. The believer can. Verse 16. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Now that should be it. Ring some alarm bells in our, our minds because it doesn't therefore depend on human desire or effort. What does it depend on? Grace. Always grace. If human effort and human desire are not a part of it, what is it? It's the grace of God that guides us into knowing Him and His character. For the Scripture said, says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Now Paul uses the mercy here of God and he, he says in verse 18, therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Now we got to look at that. Uh, Exodus 9. Exodus chapter 9. Because this brings up the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Every play that was placed on the Egyptian people was a direct slam on one of their gods. They had lots of gods and goddesses. And every one of them were proven to be false when the plagues hit, when each plague hit. There is a god of the Nile. There was a god of frogs. There was a god of gnats, flies. There is a god of cattle. In fact, every time you had a new pharaoh, you had a new, the old bull was slaughtered and embalmed and put in the hall of bulls. Uh, and that has no reference to uh, the House of Representatives or the Senate. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist on that. Uh, and so they would embalm that bull and they would take a new calf, a new bull, and raise it during that Pharaoh's reign. You want to know how many Pharaohs there were? You go to the Hall of Bulls, you count how many there are. That's how many there were. And there's a lot of upset in Egyptology about uh, the different reigns of the Pharaohs and whatnot, but it's really simple. You know how many Pharaohs they had because you know how many bulls there were. And the bull was a New Year's God of the Egyptians and uh, representing Pharaoh himself. And all those plagues was a slam against one of their gods. Um, I'm going to uh, look at this real quick. And, and get to uh, verse uh, 13. There's a plague of hail coming. But before that we have the Nile turning to blood. We had the frogs, and they actually had little frog idols and they, uh, for the, the darkness in the underworld, demonology and whatnot. They had a little idol for the frogs. Uh, there was a plague of gnats, the third one that hit. And then we have the uh, plague of livestock. Of course, livestock was very obviously a slam against their worship of, of the cattle. And remember the Israelites when they uh, broke away from God at Mount Sinai and they made a golden calf, Aaron did, and they 
said, Behold the gods who brought you out of Egypt. And they began to worship that God and then involve themselves in sexual immorality because all of the worship of the ancient world with other religions involves sexual immorality. In. So the fourth plague is a plague on livestock. And then there's a plague of boils that come. That's five. There are five more to come. And now we read. Oh, let's see. Let's go to verse 15. Chapter 9, verse 15. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So when we're talking about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, we're talking about Pharaoh had a chance to turn in the first plague, the second plague, the third plague, the fourth plague, the fifth plague. Even his advisors say, this is the hand of God. You know, uh, we need to pay attention to what's going on here. Uh, when you, you're going to have the plague of hail, it'll be the sixth plague that happens. And all that, those people who believed what God said got their servants and their cattle undercover. And those who didn't, they left them out in the open and they died with the, the tremendous hail that fell. And God says at point five, we've already had five plagues, and points the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth plague are going to happen. God says, normally by now, I would have taken you out. Because you've reached a point in your life where you will never say yes. God knows our hearts, and He knows uh, who will and still has a chance. For instance, He knew Paul when he was railing against believers and having them murdered and having them ransacked and all that, he still knew that Paul had some positive volition in his soul and met him on the Damascus Road and Paul believed. With Pharaoh, there's no light left. He is never going to say yes to the gospel. He's never going to listen to what God says. And God said, normally, I'd have taken you out, buddy. That tells us something that I always take comfort in. If you meet someone, no matter how bad they seem to be, um, if they're still alive, there's still a chance they could turn to Christ. There's still a chance they could turn to Christ. And so we should evangelize kindly, respectfully, no matter how much hindrance there is to it. Because normally, when a person gets to the place where they have a total blackout of their soul, a hardening of their heart, nothing can penetrate them. And that's a hardening of their own heart. God didn't have to turn on a hardening switch. All he did was give them evidence that he was there and there was only one true and living God. And now Pharaoh has got to the point where he's never going to say yes to God no matter what God does. So, God says, normally, I'd have taken you out. But I'm going to let you live <clears throat> so that as an unbeliever saying no to God, when you say no, thousands of people in the Mediterranean are going to say, I believe. And we know that's true because when they got to Jericho, 40 years later, they got to Jericho, and who did they find there? Rahab the harlot, who heard what happened before she was born. And she believed in the God of Israel. So when Pharaoh says no, thousands of people in the Mediterranean world come to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why Pharaoh was allowed to live. But when it says God hardened his heart, how did God harden his heart? Did he make it impossible for him to believe? No. He simply gave him more evidence. Now, I, I take a parallel to this. If you're talking to someone about Christ, and they come to the point where they don't want to hear another word, don't talk to them, don't talk about it. You keep your mouth shut and pray for them. 
because any more would just harden them more. And now only God can reach them. That's what happened when Jesus started teaching in parables. When he started teaching in parables, it was because the religious leaders, the Pharisees and whatnot, they had come to the point where they had said no so many times about this Jesus that if they kept saying no, they would never turn. So Jesus starts to teach in parables so that they won't quite understand it and they can't quite say no to what they don't understand. And he teaches his disciples what the parables mean. A sower went out to sow. God gets his word out. It falls on good soil, rocky soil. Birds, demons come and pick that soil out. And, and that is a, a kind of a key for the other parables. And he's speaking, and only his disciples will understand the meaning of it. And those unbelievers have their negative volition put in check until he raises from the dead. And that's the last great sign to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, or rulers of Israel. Forty years of evangelism after Jesus ascends for them to turn. And when they will not, the nation is destroyed by Rome. But God will be merciful to these unbelievers, giving them many more chances. And we read in the book of Acts, that many Pharisees came to believe in Jesus Christ. So it was effective. And, uh, and that's the idea of a hardened heart. Uh, it's something we do ourselves. It's like you tell your son to go out and mow the lawn, and he ignores you, and you, and you add a little discipline, go out and mow the lawn. Next day it's still not mowed. And it's easier each time to say no and be negative and you don't want that. A person that says no once can say no easier the second time or the third or the fourth. And so God graciously is giving unbelievers chances to believe. Oh, I can't remember his name. Bill, uh, anyway. He's an evangelist, and he said he believes that a person has to hear the gospel eight times before they respond. Well, if that's so, God's pretty gracious and patient with the unbeliever, that's for sure. Now, let's go back to our passage in Romans 9. The whole point of God letting Pharaoh continue to say no instead of taking him out of the world is so that other people would hear Pharaoh's no and they'd say, yeah, but I believe. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. But why? He has mercy so people will come to him. That's the only reason. He didn't, he's not capricious about it. He's not, he doesn't just pick people at random, have mercy on others not. He's not like that. He has mercy on everyone. He is patient with everyone. He has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. And here's something different. And he hardens whom he wants to harden. Does God want people to have a hardened heart and go to hell? In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're told, it is God's will that every person come to the Savior. Every person. Why don't they come to the Savior? Because we have free will. A lot of people, when they see these verses, they take free will and they toss it out the window. They say, well, God just does all the stuff. He chose, chooses those who are going to go to heaven and chooses those that are going to hell. And we shouldn't even question that because he knows what he's doing. And, you no. Know, they're making God out to be a meaning. Really. He wants all people. And he's going to use every means to bring a person to salvation. On the judgment day, the people who have not believed all of their works that they've done in life, that they would promote themselves by. The books are open. The book of works. And all of the things that they've done, maybe amazing things and whatnot and the issue is 
does the work that they did, is it greater than the work of Christ on the cross? And the answer is no. And so their works condemn them. They don't save them. But many people believe that works are the key for us to get to heaven. No, it is the work of Christ that is the key. In chapter 6 of John, Jesus was asked, what works must we be doing to do the work of God? And Jesus said, this is the work you believe in His Son whom He sent. Okay. So, every person will know beyond a shadow of a doubt, although they suppress it and they deny it, every unbeliever will understand they had multiple chances to believe. And their unbelief is their own fault, not God's. He gave multiple chances to believe. Chapter 9. I hope that helps a little bit in the hardening concept. Uh, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? Now the answer to that question is, because we use our free will volition to reject Him. That's, that's the ultimate answer to that question. For who is able to resist His will? And that's the concept that God just arbitrarily decides certain people get to go to heaven certain people don't. But he never arbitrarily, he, he reaches every human that reaches God consciousness is going to understand that he's there. Romans chapter 1 they know he's there by the created order and they deliberately suppress that information but that was their choice but who are you human being to talk back to God. To accuse God of unrighteousness says a lot about us, but nothing about God. That has nothing to do with His character. He is righteous, perfect, and just in every way. And as with all human beings, as it says in the book of Proverbs, people uh, get in trouble. They, they make errors and and they, uh, they fail and want to, and they shake their fist at God. They had the decision and they make the decisions and they fail at their decisions and life gets rough for them and they blame God. Well, did they ever ask God to be a part of their life anyway? For who is able to resist His will? There are two wills here and we always have to remember that. The free will of man, volition, is the first thing that God gave us in terms of establishment principles. He gave us volition. He gave us marriage. He gave us families. And He gave us government. And those are all to protect us for our protection. And the first one He gave us is volition, that we can choose against God. Adam and Eve chose against God in the garden. And it wasn't a matter that God made them partake of the tree. They had the information they needed, but they partook of the tree in deliberate disobedience. Eve in ignorance, Adam, he was not ignorant. So, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? The problem is, his ways are higher than our ways as the heavens are higher than the earth. And so we don't comprehend the full picture. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? We do that all the time. We do that all the time. You see it in, in spades uh, today in our society. I think God made a mistake. I should have been a girl. Well, God doesn't make mistakes. But you do. You're disoriented. That doesn't mean God is disoriented. It's the same thing here. Um, 
shall that which is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Now, the potter making a pot, a vessel, has a plan in his mind. That's God. And he knows what he's going to do. And he knows the material he has. Some material's got too much junk in it. You know, too much uh, hard material and, and, and it's all kinds of stuff in it. Well, there's only so much you can do. You can't make a fine vase out of coarse potter, uh, coarse clay. So the potter will say, I can make a chamber pot out of this because he knows what he's working with. And that's what he does. And so he gives unbelievers some amazing abilities and uh, tremendous uh, thinking abilities at times and, and good intelligence. Why? So they could come to know him. So that they could look around and they could see it. And many scientists have done that very thing. They've come to the point where they've said, this is not an accident. There's someone behind this. And that's because God made them into a certain pot to use their talents so that they could know him. And that's the way with all of us. Of course, the great thing about regeneration, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, is these old clay pots, and the clay is just junk, you know, just, it's just full of pollution and whatnot. All of a sudden, we can become pots for a very noble use. And um, we have genetics. We also have epigenetics. And we have a genetics beyond that. And many times scientists find that it seems like we can make decisions and change our genetics. We may be predisposed to certain things. And yet if we decide, no, I'm gonna exercise, I'm gonna eat healthy, I'm gonna do these things, it can actually change our genetics and we can become healthy. And of course, more useful to ourselves. Well, the way with God is, yeah, we, we are a lump of clay and he's gonna make something out of us, something useful that other people will come to know Christ, that you yourself would realize that he's there. And so we come to Christ and all of a sudden the junk is taken away, the imperfections, and he can make us more and more into something that is beautiful. Uh, you know, there's a lot of difference between a chamber pot and a vase made by the masters of China. And the, and the cost is different too. Uh, and we can become a precious vessel in his hands because he's always working on us and making us that which he can use in his kingdom. Our free will is totally involved. I mean, I can come to Christ and not get with it and not take in his word and, and not pay attention to what he's saying. Well, he, he, can, he can still make something out of me, but not what he could have made out of me. Uh, we, as it says in uh, Timothy, it talks about you know, a person's house with all kinds of vessels. And we can become a vessel for very precious, very uh, costly use by our own volition in growing. And here we have, can the clay say to the potter, you know what you're doing here, buddy? No, the clay is just material. And God is going to do the best with that clay. For who is able to, uh, excuse me, but who of you, a human being, who are you, a human being, talk back to God, shall that, shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? There's a lot of that talk today. Why did you make me a boy when I'm really a girl? No, God knew what he needed, and he knew exactly what would fit your personality and would give you a maximum opportunity to know Jesus Christ, and that's what he made you. Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery 
for special purposes. Could be to, to hide, they didn't have the drawers like we have in sacks and different things. They put everything in pots. And some of those pots, well, some of them were chamber, chamber pots they, uh, for going to the bathroom. Uh, others were, uh, we held uh, some uh, gold or silver. Others were, uh, had to find uh, oil and very expensive, and others for, for grain that you'd use for eating. It just depended on what kind of pot you had. If you had a crack pot, uh, and it, but it wasn't broken completely, you could put grain in it as long as it didn't leak out. You couldn't put any oil in it, but you had some use for these pots. And God, in His infinite wisdom, and that's something we'll see in eternity, in the Hall of Records, we can go and look at our life and see what God wanted to make of us and wanted to do with our life and wanted to bless us with. And we'll say, wow, he had a great plan. And then with all our resistance, our sin in our life, our going to strain and whatnot, what he still made our life of and still made us an influence of other people to know Christ. And yes, God has, the potter has the right to make out of the lump of clay whatever serves his purpose to the glory of God. And God does that. What if God, although choose, chosen to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction. Did God know that Pharaoh would not say yes? Yeah, because God knew Pharaoh. And here we are, this is the present right here. And we see the present, okay? We recognize the past. We have memories and we can recognize the past. Fish don't have good memories. Throw a lure in and catch them and they get off and throw the lure back in and catch them again. They don't say, you know, I think I recognize that. In the past, they don't have that type of thing. But we remember the past. We know the future, excuse me, the present. We know nothing of the future, absolutely nothing. But God has omniscience. He knows everything. He knows everything in the future. He knows every decision we'll make. And he knows exactly what will be the results of those decisions good or bad. And so he can leak out some information and tell us what's going to happen in the future. And he has in his word. And always revolves around Christ. He's going to tell us what he's going to do for Christ's people, the Jews, and for Christians, and tell us of his second coming, tell us of the rapture, tell us of the millennium, that's stuff that's future. We don't know future stuff. We know nothing about the future, but God does. And so now and again, he puts some information about the future in so we can see he knows what he's doing and we can trust him. The unbeliever may say, well, he's arbitrary. Uh, well, no, actually he knows he has all the facts. And you know, just as a, a mother or a father with their child, so many times in life, they don't know what will happen, but they know what their child will do because they know their child. They know what that child will say, no or yes. They know what that child will do because they know the child. God knows us perfectly. And he knows unbelievers perfectly. It is not his will that any unbeliever perish. I keep saying that because Many people get into chapter 9, chapter 10, and whatnot, and they say, well, God's just going to choose people to go to heaven and reject the others. Not at all. He is not willing that any should perish, but all come to a saving knowledge of Christ and a knowledge of his word. What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy? whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called not only from the Jews, 
but also the Gentiles. Now, when the Jews were reading this, that was very offensive to them. They did not believe Gentiles could be saved unless they submitted to the Old Testament, became Jewish basically, and then worshiped with the Jews. No Gentile could possibly be saved. Only the Jews could be saved. Um, and so that, that was part of the great resistance that Paul had. The Jews didn't like the thought that God would also have mercy on Gentiles. Personally, I'm very thankful he had mercy on the Gentiles because, you know, it, it's eternal life for us. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I'll call them my beloved one who is not my beloved one. Now, let's get an idea of Hosea. Hosea was told to go and marry a prostitute. Was she a prostitute at the time he had married her? Probably not. Um, but she was going to become a prostitute. God knows the future. And he loved her. And they had their first child. And their second child, he names it, I'm not sure if that's mine. And the third child they had, that's not my child. Now that's a, we could say, that family has some problems. Uh, there's a lot of stress in that family, absolutely. Uh, they are certainly challenged. And his wife deserted him and the three boys and went off to sexual escapades. When Hosea comes back to her, she's on the auction block being sold as nothing. She's used up, nobody cares for. The princes that she con consorted with, they don't want her anymore. Nobody wants her anymore. She's being sold as the lowest of slaves. And Hosea goes and he buys her. Now this is a picture of Israel. Israel went after other gods and deserted their husband, the Lord God. But God, in discipline, of course, she was in self-induced misery, got to the very end of her rope. It was a miserable life she was in. And Hosea is told, bring her back, which is exactly what God is going to do with the Jewish people. Those who have rejected him and crucified him and say all manner of evil against him, he's going to bring them back to himself. And we'll read in chapter 11, all Israel will be saved. Such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Such a discipline on their life that makes them wake up to the reality of their position. And yet, God is going to redeem them. Now, there's a, a phrase in uh, verse 11. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see it later. It simply says, don't be arrogant. Don't say, oh, well, the Jews were tossed out, you know, and never going to use Jewish people. He just uses us. <laughs> we're, the, we're the chosen now. Most Sunday school literature teaches that, that the Jews are defunct, they're gone. It's now the, the church it is, takes the place of the Jewish people. That is not true. God still has a plan for the Jewish people. And it's arrogance to say God is not going to use the Jews again. The very place where it said to them, you're not my people, they will be called children of the living God. So God is going to change the status of unbelieving Jews to being his people. How? By regeneration. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of Israel is like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. The remnant are those who have believed in Jesus Christ as Savior. In every generation, thousands of Jews believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. But there are many more tens of thousands who do not. And the remnant is always 
the group that God uses. He doesn't use all the Israelites, but he uses the remnant. So within the whole number of Israel, there is a remnant that stay faithful to God. Even in the millennium, the sons of, of Zadok are going to be used in the temple because in the worst times of apostasy, they were faithful to the Lord and they will serve the Lord in the millennial temple. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. And what is it that's going to turn the Jews? When they go through the tribulation, the greatest pressure upon the Jewish people they have ever known, and they've known a lot of pressure. They've known a lot of pressure with Hitler. They've known a lot of pressure with the Tsar. Uh, they've known a lot of pressure with many people in many countries, but this will be the greatest pressure on the Jewish people ever, and it will wake them up to their need for Jesus Christ. There'll be 144,000 Jewish evangelists who evangelize Jew and Gentile. There are gonna be Moses and Elijah who evangelize them. In the midst of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation, they're gonna to turn to Christ. It will be so obvious what they need, and it's, it's spoken by angels who pass over at noon. It's spoken by the two witnesses. It's spoken by many uh, martyrs who are killed for giving the word out and the 144,000, etc. And when he ends it, he ends it quickly. He appears and it's all over. And he destroys the armies arrayed against the Jewish people who are holding out at Jerusalem. And he wipes them all out and he establishes his reign on planet Earth. Verse uh, 29. It is just as Isaiah had pr said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, if God hadn't given us some Jews in every generation who believed, what would have happened to the Jewish people? Well, what happened to the Etruscans? What happened to all of the dozens of people groups of the earth who are gone from history? They, they're just gone. They were all killed. They merged into other people, groups. Uh, and how could the Jews, not even, have, not even having a land of their own, could still remain Jews? Well, he gave them the word of God, which is a tremendous advantage. And they stuck to those traditions. Even as unbelieving Jews, they stuck to those traditions. And if God had not made sure that there would be a remnant a nucleus of Jews who would believe. We would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were totally destroyed by sulfur and fire that rained down upon them because they had reached the end of their life in, in that community because they were totally saturated in immorality and rejection of the truth. Um, and Sodom and Gomorrah are still examples today of people who are so corrupt, so anti-Christ. And there's still a warning today of their destruction that will take place. And that's what the Jews would be like. If God had not reached down and in every generation saved Jews, this happens all the time. Janet Markle uh, and her Olive Tree Ministries, she was a Jewish girl, I think she's around 11 or so, when she heard a Jewish evangelist and she believed in Christ, it changed her life, obviously, and she's been evangelizing Jew and Gentile ever since. If God had not reached out in every generation, there would be no Jews. When the, uh, the Kaiser, or Kaiser means Caesar, but try to be Caesar. The Kaiser of Germany asked his chaplain, what evidence do you have that the Bible is God's word? He said, the Jewish people, they're still here. What then shall we say that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness. They weren't running after being right with God. 
They were doing their own thing, which always degenerates into immorality. Uh, their religions became immoral. Uh, it, it, it never glorified God. Just pick any religion or any uh, worship that they had. It always degenerated. When you have the Temple of Diana, or you have uh, the Areopagus in uh, Corinth or whatnot, where the hundreds and hundreds of prostitutes would descend every night into the city. And they were the ladies who ran the worship. Um, we always degenerate. Unless we have a standard we can go by and the power from God to go by, we degenerate. The Gentiles weren't pursuing righteousness. They were pursuing selfishness. They were pursuing self-pleasure. Everything self. They, they were hating and being hated. Titus. Chapter 3. I'll just read it for us. Titus 3, 3, it begins, At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. That's describing us, all of us. Titus 3, 3, now 3, continuing in 3, 3, We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Well, no wonder we have troubles. No wonder we have warfares. This is the nature of what we go after. But, the great conjunction of contrast, but God. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He's willing to have mercy on anyone who will turn to Him. And He gives abundant opportunities for us to know Him. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, etc. Okay. What made a difference? Salvation. That's where God's mercy is truly seen. That He takes debase and hating creatures and turns them into his children. Let's turn back to Romans chapter 9. I'm going to start verse 30 again. What should we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, we were trying to be good people. We were trying to do things that pleasured ourselves. We were trying to be selfish. Have obtained it. They didn't pursue righteousness, but they attained it. A righteousness that is by faith, or what we would say, by trust. Just by trusting in the Savior. But the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal. They didn't become righteous by following the Ten Commandments and all the other commandments. They always fell short. Why not? Because they pursued it not by trust or faith, but as if it were by works. And today, if you ask Jewish people what is the basis of their worship, it's doing good to others. Doing good to mankind. And this is what they'll say, because they don't have a sacrificial system. They used to have a sacrificial system, which the blood sacrifice is a picture of the one who would come to take care of them. They don't have that anymore. So, what, what are they going to do? Well, they decided, we'll do good works, and that will be our sacrifice. Many times, good works turn out to be bad works. Because in the attempt to do good works, what do they do? They rejected Jesus Christ and crucified Him. They rejected His plan and chose their own work system plan. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith or trust, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. 
when Jesus came, He did it all. He is the cornerstone. And they stumbled over Him. No, we don't want what you're doing. We want what we're doing. Remember Cain and Abel. Cain brought beautiful things he had grown. First prize at any fair. Abel brought a lamb, an innocent lamb, to sacrifice. And God said, I accept that innocent lamb sacrifice. It's a picture of my son who will be sacrificed. And Cain was mad because, well, look what I've done. Look what the works are that I've done. I make some beautiful crops here. Why don't you accept that? And we, God will never accept as works of righteousness the things that we have done. We need to accept what He did on the cross. Not what we're doing, but what He did. They stumble over the stumbling stone, as it is written. See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble. As they walk along, they trip over, and every Jewish person stumbles over the rock, who is Jesus Christ. That is an issue. And some say, you know what, I think I want it. And others say, no, no, my good works are enough. And a rock that makes them fall and ultimately every Jewish person who is an unbeliever is going to fall. Fall so far. They'll be in the lake of fire. And the one who believes in him, but there are those who instead of stumbling over Christ, they embrace Christ. They embrace the rock. And upon that foundation, they build their life. But the one who believes in him, notice believes in him, that's all it takes, will never be put to shame. And that's the concept for all eternity. You will never be ashamed that you trusted in Christ. There's going to be a lot of people ashamed at what they trusted in in eternity because they had a chance. They know they had a chance. It was revealed to them in judgment and they remember all the times they could have said yes. And forever, they're identified with shame having rejected Christ. All right. Thank you, Father. Help us to understand that you completely include our free will volition in all your decisions. And you're able to take we who are the weak links in life and put them in your plan and make it a strong, indestructible plan. Help us to trust you no matter what, to make no regard to our goodness but all our praise to the goodness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray, amen.